Hello, everyone. This is Keith Stone with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and we're here for another Cosmos Society online open house. Our guest today is Casey Dwe of the University of Houston, Professor of Classics, um, a longtime um, I guess friend of the Center for Hellenic Studies. You have a number of books up there um, on our website for free um, for those who would like to, to read them, and a forthcoming book um, called Achilles Unbound coming out this fall. And I'm going to spring this on you. Something that I like to do with people is ask them what got them into classics for the first time. And you haven't been our guest yet while I've been hosting. So would you mind telling us, like, was there a particular inspiration for you? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, my favorite subject uh, growing up was actually French. So I always really loved language. Um, and, and then in middle school, we read mythology, you know, probably Edith Hamilton or something. And then we read the Odyssey. And then I had the chance to go to this summer program at Duke University um, uh, when I was 13, uh, where you take a, a summer class um, and you do it in three weeks. So it's a very accelerated program and you go to class all day long um, for those three weeks. And, and so I signed up for French and I assumed that that would be the class I would take. Uh, but you had to put three other choices just in case you didn't get into your first choice. And my fourth choice, Made the Odyssey, I put ancient Greek. And <laughs> um, I went there and that was the choice I got. And I, uh, so we did all of Hansen and Quinn's Greek book in a uh, textbook in three weeks and it was incredibly hard. And I think I failed pretty miserably. I'd never studied Latin. Um, so it was really, really hard for me. But after lunch every day, we would have kind of a cultural hour where they would read to us from like Herodotus or Greek tragedy. And uh, I loved that part so much. I would run to the library after class was over and like check out all the books they had on, that I could find uh, translations of tragedies, especially tragedy and also Herodotus. And, and um, I think uh, it took me a little while before I got to Homer, but um, I just, I was, I was inspired by that class that I came home and um, immediately started taking Latin and then um, my Latin teacher started teaching me Greek as well. So I ended up having uh, four years of Latin in high school and three years of, of Greek. And that was all I wanted to do after that point and ended up going to, to Brown where they have a very unstructured curriculum. I took pretty much all my classes in the classics department. That's where, that's where I am today. <laughs> Wow, that's a better story. Okay, so now um, I'll let you talk about Iliad 20 um, and your work with the Homer Multitext Project. Yeah. Okay, so you may be wondering why Iliad 20, of all books of the Iliad. Um, well, to be honest, the choice of the book that I'm talking about today, it was somewhat accidental. Um, you know, I'm one of the editors of the Homer Multitext Project, which I'm sure um, will be talking a little bit about today. I, I already heard one question about it, which I'd be happy to answer. Um, and last summer, uh, we had one book left, just, on, just one book left of the, of the Venetus A manuscript of the Iliad left to edit, and it was Iliad 20. So I needed to read it carefully and discuss it with students um, and the faculty of um, our summer seminar that we have in connection uh, with that project. And then I also happened to be um, at work last summer on um, my forthcoming book that Keith mentioned, Achilles Unbound, which is all about why we should approach the Iliad multitextually. That is, why we shouldn't try to interpret it as a fixed and unchanging document, but as a dynamic poem that evolved over hundreds, if not thousands of years. And I think that was actually the topic that I spoke about last time when I was um, at a CHS open house. So, um, feel free to ask me more about this later if you want. So anyway, I was reading Iliad 20, and I found that this particular book seems kind of obsessed with the possibility that things will happen at the wrong time, or to put it another way, that the story will be told incorrectly. And if I'm right about that, and I'm going to discuss some passages from the book with you today, we have to wonder, what produces this anxiety? I'll jump to the punchline and say that I think it must be the multiformity of the epic tradition. There were other ways to tell Achilles' story, 
or the tale of Troy more generally. The Iliadic tradition is aware of this and asserts the primacy of its own narrative throughout, but at the same time, it gives us hints that things could go otherwise. So what I'd like to do is show some slides so we can look at passages together. Um, so I'm gonna turn on my screen sharing and hopefully that will work. Okay, can everybody still hear me? Hello? Yeah, we yes. can, we're just muted. Okay, okay. okay good. sorry about that. I just wanted to, wanted to check. Okay, excellent. All right, so you might be wondering at this point, um, just how multiform was the Homeric tradition? How many ways were there to tell the story of Troy? Both the Iliad itself and ancient scholars and modern ones for that matter, have anxiety about this question. So let's look at the beginning of Iliad 20. Zeus calls the gods to an assembly and he tells them that they may now join the battle that's taking place before the walls of Troy on whatever side they wish, something that he had expressly forbidden them to do at the beginning of book eight. The reason he has changed his mind, he explains, is that Achilles is now preparing to return to battle for the first time since his withdrawal in book one, and he's afraid that the Trojans will not be able to withstand him even for a little while. So you see, this is what, what is on the slide. Even before now, they would tremble before him when they saw him, and now, when he's terribly angry in his heart because of the death of his companion, I fear lest the wall of Troy will be sacked beyond that is contrary to fate. Apollo, the god of prophecy and the one besides Zeus most often associated with seeing into the future, likewise fears that the Trojan walls will come down too soon at Achilles' hands. This is in book 21. For he was concerned about the wall of the well-built si well city, lest the Danaeans destroy it on that day beyond fate. I find Zeus's and Apollo's fears at these passages remarkable. I mean, if the walls of Troy are destined to fall at a particular moment, how could they fall before that? Is fate something that can be changed? Is Zeus subject to fate or can Zeus alter it? But let's step back and think about what is meant by fate here. I suggest that we reframe these questions in terms of narrative. If the Iliad tells a traditional story, shouldn't Zeus and Apollo know how the story ends? Would it really be possible to change the story now and have Troy fall while Achilles is still alive and indeed at his hands? In his 1979 book, The Best of the Achaeans, our fearless leader, the director of the Center for Hellenic Studies, Gregory Nagy, argued that the first song of Demonicus in Odyssey 8, in which the Phaeacian bard narrates a quarrel between Odysseus and Achilles, um, is in fact a compressed reference to an epic tradition in which Achilles and Odysseus quarreled over whether Troy would be taken by cunning, that is the Greek word metis, or by force, ba. Naj reads the um, ancient commentary preserved in some manuscripts um, in, of the Odyssey as likewise pointing to such a tradition, which is otherwise not attested in our surviving sources. So, might we find here in the fears of Zeus and Apollo another glimpse of these two rival possibilities for the fall of Troy? If so, we have to wonder if the Iliadic tradition is indeed so multiform, so flexible, that such a radically different ending could be possible. Is there, or was there, an alternative epic universe in which Achilles really did take Troy by force? And if not, why does Zeus entertain the idea? Well, as it turns out, ancient commentators on the Iliad were concerned about these same questions. So the scolia in the margins of the so-called Townley manuscript, um, it rec they, re they record for us a fascinating variation on these verses from book 20. So let's look there. So the scolia, the scolia, the comment in the manuscript, it says, um, some write, Instead of, I fear lest the wall, they write, it is not fated, however, with Achilles still alive to sack the well-inhabited
inhabited citadel of Ilion, a wooden horse will destroy it and the craftiness that is the matis of Apeos. For how is he, that is Zeus, the one who knows what is fated and not fated, now in doubt? So embedded in this comment in the scolia are three of what we call plus verses. That is, they are verses that are only weakly attested in the textual tradition, and they don't have canonical numbers. If we want to include them in an addition, we have to call them 30 A, B, and C. But other than their weak attestation, most plus verses are just as Homeric by any number of criteria you might apply to them as the ones that get canonical line numbers. In my work, I'm typically just as interested in these extra verses as I am in the more canonical ones, if not more so. They give us insight into other Iliads, other performances beyond the one we know. These particular alternative verses make clear that Troy is not going to fall at the hands of Achilles, but rather as a result of the matis of the wooden horse. Problem solved. But the commentator, in seeking to solve a narratological, mythological, and indeed existential problem, now presents us with a textual one. What is the source of these verses that, quote unquote, some write, and how do we rec reconcile them with our received text? All we are told, in the typically compressed way of the scolia, is that some, presumably editors, write these verses, presumably in their editions. They're not a seamless replacement for line 30 of book 20, however. If we replace line 30 with these verses that some write, this is what we get. We get, even before now, they would tremble before him when they saw him. And now when he's terribly angry in his heart because of the death of his companion, it is not fated, however, with Achilles still alive to sack the well-inhabited citadel of Ilium, a wooden horse will destroy it and the craftiness of Apeos. Now we can assume an ellipsis here, that sometimes happens. Like, um, I don't know if you remember in book one, there's a part where Agamemnon says, well, if the Achaeans wanna give me another prize, but then he doesn't ever finish the sentence. So we can make it work, but it's more likely that the scolia here are quoting from an edition in which the entire passage was substantially different from what we find in the medieval manuscripts of the Iliad. Now these verses are in no way objectionable beyond the fact that they just don't survive elsewhere. There's nothing unhomeric about them. They're simply an attested multiform of the verses transmitted in our medieval manuscripts. It's passages like this that have led me and others to take a multi-textual approach to the Homeric epics, which means that we do not restrict ourselves to or seek to establish a single version of the text of these poems when we interpret them. Instead, we try to understand the poetics of the tradition as a whole by way of these multiforms. Now I'm gonna pause for a second and stop screen sharing and just see if anybody has any questions before I go on. Uh, hi, this is Bill. So uh, when uh, Thetis goes up to Olympus and uh, begs for things to change a little, little bit in the battle, uh, Hera's response later on after she after Thetis leaves, I think that kind of clearly indicates that changing fate is an option at this point. She gets all upset that Zeus might have conspired with Thetis to change things. Yes, so it's very interesting. At various points throughout the epic, Zeus considers changing fate, but it never actually happens. And it always seems to be that in theory it's possible, but the consequences would be so cataclysmic that no one ever does it. Well, um, I, I think that's, for me, that's a lot of the uh, motivation for that action. It's like the death of Sarpedon. Zeus is traumatized by the thought the guy is gonna die, but everybody says, if you save him. So that's the warning. I think there are a lot of times the gods are protecting themselves and their, their way of life by not letting this thing happen. And we're gonna see a reference to to that um, Sarpedon um, example in just a minute, but um, but I, I do just want to step back and say that I think in the Iliad um, there's a different there the talk of fate and, and I'll come back to it, but I think the idea of fate 
when things are said to be beyond fate, it's really about the poetic tradition. You can't mess with the poetic tradition. Now, what's tricky about that is the poetic tradition is multiform. And yet, each, 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 po each poem asserts that it is right. tradition, right? right? And, so, um, and so, yeah, there's this idea of messing with the story. So I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to get at with, the, with these passages that we're going to look at today. So I'll go, I'll go back to my slides um, because we have some, I have some other texts that I want to show you. But um, I'm definitely happy to take questions. Okay. So taking this opening passage that we've been looking at as a jumping off point, I think we can see that as a whole, book 20 seems preoccupied with the mythological or poetic tradition and things happening at possibly the wrong time. So I'm gonna discuss three examples with you from the book. Uh, first of all, um, the fate of Achilles is very much an underlying theme. Uh, at one point early on in the book, Hera notices um, that Aeneas is going after Achilles and she's worried about him, uh, which is interesting. But let's just pause here for a moment and note how momentous this is. <laughs> we have the hero of the Roman epic tradition, long before there was a Roman epic tradition, coming face to face with the hero of the Homeric epic tradition. And this isn't the first time that it's happened, because when they engage each other in Book 20, Achilles reminds Aeneas that he ambushed him once before, and when he was, you know, tending to his sheep, and he chased him all the way to Lernesos, which is where, uh, you know, which Achilles then sacked, and that's where he got Briseis. Um, but, um, you know, we have reason to believe that Aeneas was very much the subject of epic poetry long before he came to be celebrated as the ancestor of the Romans. So I'm going to show you some slides about that. Um, he fights against Diomedes, for example, in Book 5, uh, where Diomedes hits him with a huge stone and wounds him, and then Aphrodite whisks him out of the battle, so he's been saved before. And then in Iliad 13, um, we find this passage about him that I have on the slide. Deiphobus, Deiphobus was of two minds, whether to go back and fetch some other Trojan to help him or to take up the challenge single-handed. In the end, he deemed it best to go and fetch Aeneas, whom he found standing in the rear, for he had Manus against Priam, because in spite of his brave deeds, he did not give him his due honor. So this is such an interesting passage. I mean, is this a reference to Aeneas's Iliad, so to speak? I mean, in other words, um, did Aeneas star in his own epic story along the lines of the wrath of Achilles? The formulaic language definitely makes me think so. In any case, to return to Iliad 20, this is what Hera says. She says, we all have come down from Olympus to participate in this battle in order that Achilles not suffer anything among the Trojans today. Later, he will suffer in turn whatever things fate spun for him with her thread as he was born, when his mother gave birth to him. So we see that, at least hinted at here, this idea that maybe the story could be told incorrectly, that he could, he could be killed um, uh, right here in this battle by Aeneas, if the gods don't intervene and make sure everything uh, goes on track. But the fate of Aeneas seems to be just as much a concern as that of Achilles in this book. So just as in um, book five, Aeneas here too has to be saved from death in battle before his time. So this is a long passage and I have it on the, on the slide, but Aeneas then, he would have struck Achilles as he was springing towards him, either on the helmet or on the shield that covered him, and Achilles would have closed with him and dispatched him with his sword. Had not Poseidon, Lord of the Earthquake, been quick to mark, 
and said forthwith to the immortals, sorry. <laughs> you know, I have on the slide, I think I have the Samuel Butler translation. Maybe I should read you my own translation that I have. But in any case, um, alas, I, I feel grief um, for great Aeneas. Uh, I have Akos for him. He's gonna now go down to the house of Hades, vanquished by the son of Peleus, fool that he was to give ear to the counsel of Apollo. Apollo will never save him from destruction. Why should this man have grief when he is guiltless to no purpose and in another's quarrel? Has he not at all times offered acceptable sacrifice to the gods that dwell in heaven? Let us then snatch him from death's jaws, lest the son of Kronos be angry should Achilles slay him. It is fated, moreover, that he should escape and that the race of Dardanos, whom Zeus loved above all the sons born to him of mortal women, shall not perish utterly without seed or sign. For now indeed has Zeus hated the blood of Priam, while Aeneas shall reign over the Trojans, he and his children's children that shall be born hereafter. Of course, the Romans believed that this was their family line. They believed that he went on to found the Roman race. Um, and it's remarkable that Aeneas does have such a prominent place uh, in, the, in the Greek epic traditions, since he's, he is a Trojan, but he's clearly uh, integral. Uh, if you look at Greek face paintings, um, you see that the story of him escaping uh, with his father and his son from the burning city of Troy is al it's always included in uh, depictions of the sack of Troy in Greek art, including on, on the Parthenon and, and, and many other types of monumental artwork. So, uh, so clearly, you know, Aeneas was already an important um, character in the Greek epic tradition, even if he's on the Trojan side. And so here in this passage, we see that uh, it's felt that Aeneas can't possibly be allowed to die here. Earlier, we were worried about Achilles dying too soon. Now we're worried about Aeneas dying too soon. Uh, certainly he cannot die at Troy. He has to go and live on after, after the sack of Troy. And then the last passage that I want to discuss um, is, is very intriguing because uh, we're in book 20. We're two books away from book 22. And near the end of the book, Achilles almost kills Hector too soon, seemingly. So what happens is Hector notices that uh, his uh, brother Polydorus uh, has just gotten killed. And he, um, uh, so here, I'll read the passage. So when Hector took note of his brother Polydorus holding his entrails in his hands, bending to the ground, mist poured down over his eyes, nor did he endure to tarry long far off, but he came face to face with Achilles, brandishing his sharp spear like a flame. Meanwhile, Achilles, when he saw him, likewise poised his spear, and boasting, he spoke a word. This man is near, who has especially affected my Thumos, who slew my revered companion. Not still for long may we shrink from one another along the lanes of battle. He spoke, and giving him a dark look, he addressed brilliant Hector. Come closer so that, so that you may come to the snares of destruction quicker. Startled, Hector of the Shining Helm addressed him, son of Peleus, don't with your word hope to frighten me like a little child. Sorry. Um, so, sorry, I'm, um, maybe, yeah, don't. Yeah, don't, don't, don't with your word hope to frighten me like a little child, since I know too how to speak both insults and curses. I know that you're good and I'm far inferior to you but indeed these things lie in the lap of the gods. If although being inferior, I may take away your life upon hitting you with my spear, since indeed my arrow too was sharp before. He spoke and poising his spear, he cast it, but Athena turned it back with her breath from glorious Achilles, blowing very gently, and it came back to brilliant Hector and fell before his feet. Meanwhile, Achilles eagerly rushed at him, desiring to kill him, shouting terribly, but Apollo snatched him away easily as a god can and covered him in much mist. Then three times swift-footed brilliant Achilles rushed at him with his bronze spear and three times he struck deep mist. But when he rushed at him like a diamond for a fourth time, with a terrible cry, he addressed him with winged words. You have escaped death for now, dog. Truly near to you did evil come, 
But for now, Phoebus Apollo has protected you, to whom you are going to pray when you go into the den of javelins. Surely I will finish you when I meet you again later, if some one of the gods is a helper for me also. But now I will attack others of the Trojans, whomever I may come upon. So anyway, I find this passage, you know, really fascinating because, again, why, why include it? Um, and why did the gods have to stop the um, death of Hector now when he's only going to die uh, two books later? So uh, we can talk about that, but I think the, the, uh, the, the short answer is that it's not traditional for him to die here. He needs to die in book 22. Um, something to note, you might have uh, noticed at the beginning of the passage uh, when I, about Polydorus, uh, if you are familiar with Greek tragedy, you may be thinking, doesn't Polydorus die much later, um, killed in Thrace by, by Polymester, uh, for example, the story of Euripides' Hecuba, but um, in fact, there are no attestations of that version of the myth that's found in Euripides uh, in the epic cycle. Um, so the, the Iliad does not seem to be um, aware of that tradition. Also, I wanted to say that uh, there's another plus verse uh, in this passage. It's, it's actually the final, it's right at the end of the, of the death of, uh, describing the death of Polydorus. And you can see that this, so this is an extra, verse that, that is there in Papyrus 1470. Uh, and, and there's only a few letters. I tried really hard to find some kind of formulaic verse about like maybe eyes closing in death um, that would fit here. And I could not find anything that worked with what West reports. So this could be a uh, research project for someone. Um, but yeah, there seems to be another verse here um, and we just can't uh, reconstruct it, but it's another, another plus verse. And then um, I also wanted to mention that uh, the ancient critic uh, Aristarchus athetized, that is he, he marked as not belonging, uh, at least seven passages of three verses or more in book 20 alone. And each of these athetesis um, marks are fascinating. They give us a lot of insight into an editor who was struggling to account for a mythological and poetic tradition that was multiform and at times contradictory. So let me just um, say a few concluding remarks and then um, I would love to take your questions and we can have as much discussion as you want. So there's no Iliad in which Achilles goes home after quarreling with Agamemnon. And there's no Iliad in which Achilles himself sacks Troy. There's no Odyssey in which Odysseus decides to stay with Calypso after all. The Iliad and Odyssey were traditional poems whose stories were deeply ingrained in the culture. And though the poems unquestionably evolved over time, they did so within a conservative and highly sophisticated system of composition and performance, which claimed to be inspired by the muses who were believed to have witnessed the events told. But here again, we can see how myth and narrative are inextricably intertwined, and how fate, at least as it's presented in epic, is in many ways a reflex of both. Uh, as we've seen, there are many places within the Iliad where fate is suggested to be at least potentially multiform. Most famous is Achilles stated, choice of fates in book nine, when he implies that there are two possibilities for how his life will turn out. Um, either he'll die at Troy and have a Kleos, that's glory and song that is unwilting, or he'll return home and have a long but unremembered life. Could Achilles really have chosen to return home at this point? Certainly in terms of narrative, it cannot be a viable variation. There's no Iliad if Achilles, if Achilles goes home. Likewise, in terms of myth, Jonathan Burgess has convincingly argued that Achilles does not really have a choice of fates in the Iliad, though he may have traditionally had such a choice before the war. The Iliad consistently presents Achilles as fated to die at Troy at the hands of Apollo. 
Burgess writes, it's clear that no other passages in the Iliad support Achilles' assertion in Book 9 that he can choose to live. Achilles is never unaware that he will die at Troy, nor does he ever really think that his fate is avoidable. Indeed, Thetis is said to have foretold to Achilles his death repeatedly. The word uses polaki. Instead, the proclaimed choice is part of a larger struggle on the part of Achilles to accept his mortality, which is a major theme of the poem. And I'll quote Burgess again, the dishonor of Achilles by Agamemnon and the death of Patroclus are major events that provoke Achilles to undergo contemplation and eventual re-acceptance of his fate. So here again then, as in Iliad 20, we find contemplation of a narrative alternative that probably was never a genuine multiform in myth, nor did it ever actually come into being in song. It's the contemplation of the alternative that's part of the tradition. The alternative was never in fact chosen, nor could it be, because the poet and his audience already know the tradition. They know what Achilles quote unquote chose. So Achilles is bound by fate and by narrative tradition, but Achilles' poem, the Iliad, was not fixed in monolithic and antiquity. It was multiform. And the wider epic tradition from which the Iliad emerged was more multiform still. Now, I promised that I was gonna say something about Sarpedon, and I thought I'd had a passage on here, but I obviously don't, because I'm at the end of my slides. But there's a passage in book 15 where um, Zeus wakes up after his seduction by Hera. And he realizes that the narrative is like spinning out of control. And he's like, what is this? You know, and he's furious. And he says, okay, this is how it's going to be. This is going to happen. And this is going to happen. And this is going to happen. And this is going to happen. He basically tells the whole story, even uh, to the, to the end of the Iliad and beyond. And one of the things that he includes is the, the fate of his, his own son, Sarpedon. Um, so uh, it's clear that, that Zeus feels there's a correct way for the story to be told, even if it comes at great personal cost. All right, so I'm gonna stop the, the screen sharing and take questions. Um, let me see. Okay, I'm back. Wow, thanks. Um, I did see some hands for some questions. Um, Astrid, I saw that you had one earlier. And then Georgia, I saw. Yes. Um, actually, I have two questions. My first one, do you imply that the poet wants us or expect us to edit his text in a way to make it uh, fully universal and timeless? Like, we have the <laughs> chance to... I, I... I can't hear you. Can, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. You said, does the poet yeah. want us to edit his text? Edit, like to unedit his text? Are we, are we allowed to edit his text? Well, I don't believe in a single poet. So um, I'm not, so you know, this is, you know, I don't, I don't see there to be one version of the text. Um, that's sort of basically the whole foundation of, all of my research and the Homer multitext and everything, which is that there's in an oral tradition, we should not expect there to be a single original. Um, this is not my idea. This is, goes back to the field work of Milman Perry and Albert Lord, but especially Albert Lord articulated in his work, The Singer of Tales, that there can be no original. There's only just multiple instantiations of a notional original and each song you know, from performance to performance, it's never exactly the same. But not, even beyond just variations of sort of, you know, leaving an episode out or including an episode or shorter or longer versions of the story, there's also traditional narrative alternatives. That is, you can have the story go one way or go another way. And the Iliad seems to be asserting throughout that there is a correct way for the story to go. Um, but it also seems to signal that it's aware of other ways that someone might tell the tale and is worried about it. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, uh, I, in terms of editing the text, what the sort of foundational principle of the Homer Melty text is, is in a way we unedit the text because what we do is we take all the historical examples of the text, that's our goal at least, to take the historical examples of the text, text that we know um, and, uh, 
and then and make them available to people because we really shouldn't be focusing on just one edited version that's really just the made up idea of one editor hope that's clear yes yes <laughs> And then my second question is about, you know, this uh, book 20 is the first time that I see a guy who does not dehumanize his enemy, Poseidon talking about Aeneas, and I was, which made him quasi human. I was wondering if there is any, any, any other instance that a guy show pity for, you know, for his enemy, somebody he would kill, you know, compared to, you know, the full hardiness to Athena and Hera. And I, I was just wondering if there's any, any other passage that I can express himself like that, like, uh, alas, I feel grief. Um, I, I don't know that I would see, I know what you mean when you say the enemy of the god, because their gods are on different sides of the Trojan War. Um, usually when we see pity, the, what I, comes to my mind is Zeus feeling pity for someone who has to die, especially um, Hector in book 22. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's interesting. It's a very interesting point. I never really thought of it in that way of that Poseidon is feeling grief for the enemy, but I would say as a whole that the Iliad feels grief for both sides. Sorrow and lament are expressed for both the Greeks and the Trojans throughout. It's one of the things that I'm most remarkable, especially, uh, humans in the, in the epics, human characters feel grief for even um, even the other side. Uh, there's a very uh, remarkable simile in book eight of the Odyssey when Odysseus is compared to a woman who's being taken captive in battle, someone who could easily have been um, one of his own victims in the Trojan War, and yet his grief is compared to hers. So uh, I think that there's an, a remarkable equity of compassion for both sides in the, in the Iliad. Uh, and the Odyssey, and and so I think uh, it certainly does not surprise me, I guess, to say that uh, to see that a god can feel compassion for the other side as well. Thank you, Georgia. You still have a question. Thank you very much. I was uh, I was wondering um, whether if we reverse the argument, um, the fact that uh, these options are mentioned so explicitly as could we just take another path no we cannot you know but let's see how far we go um is it a marker if we accept the line of thought about the panathenaic uh, bottleneck is it a marker that what we have now is the panathenaic bottleneck and we go this way down the narrative road Yes, I definitely think so. Um, I mean, I haven't done a lot of work on, on the Pan-Athenaic bottleneck myself, so I wouldn't say that I know for sure, but my idea would be very much in keeping with it, which is that uh, once we get a Pan-Athenaic version of the Iliad, that there's a perceived correct way to tell the story, to perform it in, in, in these highly regulated competitions that took place there. And if you are gonna, you can't, you can't deviate from it. Um, and so you can signal your awareness of these other traditions out there, but you don't go that way because that's not the way we do it in the Panathenaea. So I definitely agree. And just the last one is about Virgil in Aeneid because he actually uses the, the challenge about fate as well most most of the time is kind of a, a rhetoric question whether you know the fate should be changed or not but even venus comes to zeus and asks what is happening father is his the fate of my son going to change what are you doing or what don't you stop but you know in virgil's case it's clear there is no uh, multiformity it's just the author coming up with a story so i think there uh, he follows the Homeric example to prove his point, saying, you know, very uh, loud and clear, I'm doing it this way, and this is the fate of the story, the way I present it. So, yes. just thought. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree, and, and but Virgil, um, what I love about Virgil is that he knows his epic tradition and, and his tragedy more than, than any of us because he had access to so much more of it and he has clearly internalized it 
in a, amazing ways. And so he can signal again his awareness of the epic tradition in which there's at least the contemplation of fate going awry uh, never actually takes place. It's always just threatened. Um, and 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 uses it uh, in his poem in a different in, in the way you say. There's a question from Sarah. Um, I had to drop out. Um, but her question is: In these passages that are kind of nods to other ways of telling the story, are there um, also nods to perhaps local dialects in which they would have been told? Are there you know, clusterings of certain kinds of features that? I have I haven't noticed anything like that, but one of the topics that I have explored in my research is the idea of local variations. Um, so there will be, you know, over time, there came to be, and when I say over time, I mean a long period of time, there came to be a sort of a canonical pan Athenaic version, Panhellenic, maybe I should say, version of the Iliad. Um, but that didn't stop epic poetry from being performed in other places. And um, at times it seems there, the Iliad shows awareness of these possible local variations, not in terms of dialect, dialect exactly, but um, in terms of uh, uh, just these other versions, possible versions of the story. So the one I most looked at is the character of Briseis, um, where uh, she seems, you know, her story, the primary version of her story um, alluded to in the, in the Iliad is that she was the queen of Lyrnassos um, and married to King Mines. Um, but there are other versions of the story, it would seem, where she is an unmarried girl, uh, perhaps from the island of Lesbos, but certainly the daughter of Bryces. Um, and she, uh, and, and so perhaps she's one of these girls that Achilles, that falls in love with Achilles as he's sacking the various towns around the Troad. Um, and then he takes her as his, his prize. Uh, but so there, uh, there, I definitely think there are local variations um, out there. Um, and uh, I, I haven't looked at them in terms of dialect, but, but certainly I agree that they're there. And I'm not the only person doing work like, like that. Um, you know, Olga Levanyuk, I know, has, has done some writing on that topic, but others as well. So I definitely think you're onto something there. Maria, you're still muted. Thank you very much, Casey, for your wonderful presentation. Um, I will just take you back because this is a topic that uh, really interests me. About this, how can I, how shall I put, it, how shall I call it, the ontological feature, Achilles' ontological feature whether he has a choice or not you just mentioned Jonathan Burgess Burgess's insight that uh, we wouldn't have the Iliad if Achilles had a choice but on on the other hand the, the more this motif of choice looms large in the tradition I mean uh, we have you know stories about um, attempts uh, of uh, Achilles being hidden or uh, uh, trying to avoid participating in uh, in the war uh, at least in the first stage and then uh, I, I remember he in uh, when he meets uh, in book one uh, if I remember correctly with uh, his mother before the famous application scene to Zeus he says that he, you know are you you uh, uh, I am short-lived mother uh, and um, then of course the, again this uh, motive the choice of motive again is being repeated do we have uh, any news from or reports from the tradition about a possible different course or or whether the, or what kind of motive this is what kind of dynamics this uh, uh, this motive adds to the to the narrative to the representation of Achilles I think it's a, a great question um, I think that thank you very much yeah no I think it's a wonderful question and I um, I think in terms of like what it adds so so the 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 choice may have existed traditionally before the war that there was some kind of turning point 
that you know there could have been where Achilles was not discovered on the island of Skiros, but obviously he was. And then it, you know, so maybe there was some kind of possible divergence that happened early on, but it didn't happen according to the tradition, right? The choice did not to not go did not get made. And then likewise, um, I think Achilles is presented as perceiving that he has a choice of fates, but he may not really have one because again, if he really had one and he really chose to go home, we don't have an we don't have an Iliad. So we know what he chooses, but but I like your idea of what does this contemplation of the fate add to the story. And I think what it does is it highlights exactly the word that you brought up that he is muntarios or whatever. Isn't that the Greek word for being short lived? Minunthavios, minunthavios, from Minuntha. That he is short lived. Um, that, I mean, if we think about it, his mother is the goddess, right? Who had to marry a mortal man um, because if her son had been, if she had gotten together with Zeus, for example, who seemed to want to, um, he, she would have born a son greater than his father. And then he could have potentially overthrown the universe, again, just as Zeus overthrew Kronos and Kronos overthrew Oranos. So we can't have that happen. And so they force her to marry a mortal. Um, and but the result of that is that she is, even if he lived to be 80 years old, she's immortal. She's going to grieve him forever, right? And, um, and, and Achilles at one point talks about how she is going to have infinite grief. She's going to have Penthos Alaston. Um, because uh, of her mortal son. So I think uh, the contemplation of a long life versus a short life for Achilles just highlights his extraordinary status as a child of a goddess, but who is destined to die. And he's not just a child of a goddess, I mean, he's the best, right? He is, um, she, was, she was the best of all child uh, readers, right? Uh, um, uh, she 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 bore a child who was faultless and strong. He shot up like a sapling. Um, <laughs> so she has this amazing child, but he's going to to die tragically young. So I think I think this contemplation of his fate just calls attention to that. And it is you know one of the more remarkable aspects of the Iliad because it kind of questions even Cleos. Is it worth it? You know, is 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 a short life in exchange for Cleos a worthy uh, trade, but in the end, it's reaffirmed, right? In the end, I mean, it took the death of Patroclus to bring him back, but in the end, he does go back and he does accept the short life in, in exchange for this Cleos that will live forever. So, um, in the end, the tradition affirms itself, but what's remarkable is that it does question itself for a good long part of the poem. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking time to answer to my question. Sure. I guess my question would be, uh, how do how do you, um, you know, I, I'm sure you don't agree with Martin West uh, in his view that, uh, you know, it was there was a there was a guy, that, whatever his name was, and he just had a whole lot of uh, rhapsodies more than anybody else, and he put them together and. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's our, that's our Iliad. But my real question is what, what, uh, how do you deal with, uh, Metas, uh, the, the, um, file shows of Pandros, the, the arrow shot of Pandros, uh, where he points out that, that books three through eight don't know the wrath of Achilles. I mean, they, they don't, you know, that's just, you know, the tr I mean, uh, there's, there's all sorts of skirmishing going on, and uh, and the and the Aristei and 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 the like. Uh, but uh, the uh, the wrath of Achilles and the the uh, decision of Zeus, uh, those things, you know, uh, they're just uh, bracketed out uh, and. And looking at the language of those books, you know, they're pretty old. I mean, they they look like like old uh, core uh, Homeric material. So, so, so I think 
that actually supports the point I'm trying to make, which is that the tradition is really flexible and multiform such that, um, so if you think about the beginning of the Odyssey, where, you know, there's an invocation of the muses and it says, you know, start, basically start the, the story at whatever point you choose, right? So there's a flexibility in where you stop and where you start and where you stop. Same thing with the story of the Trojan War. I mean, we've got 10 years of material here, at least, and um, you can start with the anger of Achilles in the 10th year of the war. You could start with, you know, the Iphigenia at Alice story. I mean, there's any number of places where you could start. And then the poet takes the song where he wants to go. Um, as it turns out, the, this tradition where it, it, it ended up, you know, including a, a lot of material that was probably uh, as old or older than the Wrath of Achilles story, um, but there's, I mean, we can't like precisely date these things, right? It's a, it was a, a vast fluid tradition of, of material that the poets could draw on. And so once Achilles is out, you could go on for, for five books. You could go on for one book. You could go on for 15 books. I mean, however long you wanted to make your story, uh, the Iliad is about as expanded as, as we could imagine for a story about the anger of Achilles, but it could have, there's no reason why it couldn't, um, go even further, right? Go even longer. So, I mean, there's a flexibility there um, of, of two different types. So the way I usually talk about it is there's a horizontal axis, right? Where you either include an episode or not include an episode, where you expand out the length of time it takes to tell the story. Um, or there's also what we call the vertical axis, where either this happens or that happens, right? Either uh, uh, Hector dies here, or he keeps living. Um, and so there's these different forms of, of variation that you can take, but one of them by, by far is the, the variation of expansion versus impress, ex, uh, compression. So in terms of Iliad 3 through 8, we could, the poet could choose to expand or compress that as, as much as they wanted to do, depending on the occasion and the time allowed and the reaction of the audience. Are they getting bored? You might need to cut it short. Or are they really into it? You keep going. And, and that's what you do. Yeah. Are they, what are, I mean, the, what, what are they advertising? I mean, I, I, let's, I, my point is, is, uh, okay, this, this doesn't belong in, in the, uh, in the Iliad. Well, well, what Iliad doesn't it belong into? Do we, do, have we really drilled into, uh, what Aristarchus and and the other traditions? I mean, there's a there are like three or four other schools that you know hadn't gotten the the press that Aristarchus did. That's a you know comment. One of them said that the Iliad should be recited in the Aeolic dialect, um, and uh, uh, th th this stuff is in that first fragment of Crates of Malos. Um, what what if we could could get an idea of what these people fifteen hundred years ago, uh, excuse me, tw uh, twenty three hundred years ago were uh, saying? Well, this is what it really is. Uh, do you think we would maybe have a a a, a, a better hold on what how to divide it up horizontally and vertically, as you were saying? Um, no, I think our, in, I think 2,300 years ago, there was awareness of the Panathenaic version of the Iliad in the Odyssey. So there was a sense that there was like a canonical version that was performed at the Panathenaea. Um, but there were, as we know from the Scolia, they, they had access to texts from other places that were different than that Panathenaic version. So we would still be dealing with multiformity, even as late as 300 BC. Uh, or the third century BC, we, we would still be dealing with multiformity already then, and that's quite late in the process. The kinds of variation of multiformity that I'm talking about, I'm talking about hundreds of years before that time, when the text was more fluid, before we got through that Panathenaic bottleneck that I forget who it was was mentioning, um, before we got through that process, and we're talking earlier on, archaic and earlier, I, I go back to the Bronze Age with my stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think that kind of variation, that kind of much more uh, 
like bigger deal, big picture or variation um, it, it is really fascinating. By the time we get to, to the Aristarchus and Xenodotus and Crites of Malos and Aristophanes of Byzantium and people like that, we're, we're dealing with texts by then, you know, texts that they have access to and are working with in a library and um, they're comparing them presumably against some sort of Panathenaic texts from uh, Athens and, um, and, and the differences that they observe are certainly very interesting and, and I mean the scholia are well worth reading for that reason um, but we're not seeing the sort of big picture variants that, um, that I'm talking about here where um, maybe, maybe something happens on a completely different timeline than what we're expecting mm -hmm. from Thanks. our earlier. Thanks, appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, and I saw that you had a question. Mm -hmm. oh, you're reading it yourself. Okay. Oh, and <laughs> somehow your microphone keeps keeps turning off. Um, Anne, did you have something to say? Yeah, I did, but I don't. Can you okay. hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. I don't know if there's an answer to my question, but if I understand you correctly, what you've said is that um, there were a lot of poets and they may have told different versions of the story. And alongside that, there is this idea of something, of uh, the way you said it was, you cannot mess with the poetic tradition. So there's this idea that there, that there is a, a, a standard poetic tradition. And it was, I was wondering, is it possible to tell where that idea came from or when it was introduced? Who introduced it? Why would they? If we have a lively, vibrant um, tradition of, of oral poetry, why would somebody come along and say, oh, no, this is, this is what it is? And okay, did that so happen at the point of it being written down, I wondered? I hope I can, I can blow your mind a little bit here. So if we if we use the if we uh, read the fieldwork of Milman Perry and Albert Lord, we can find that every poet in the tradition claims to be the standard. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Every single one is asserting that they have the true version, and anybody else you hear, it's lies. So there's this constant competition among all of the performers in this tradition as to who has the authoritative version. Now, that said, eventually there does get to be an authoritative version. So how does that happen? Well, mm. uh, again, other people besides me uh, have, have done a lot of research into the idea that the Panathenaic Festival, first, not even just the Panathenaic Festival, but other festivals such as the Panionian Festival, and then later the Panathenaic Festival, played a big role in shaping the tradition into what is the standard, what is the, the official sort of Iliad versus um, what is, is these other, you know, false narratives that are out there. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm somebody that uh, definitely is, is swayed uh, by those arguments that within the context of regulated festival performance, there came to be a sense of the correct version versus the not correct version. But, but prior to that point, earlier in the tradition, I would say that there was competition among all performers, all composers, to assert that they had the correct version. Now, they're all drawing on a common tradition, um, and there is a desire not to depart from that tradition. There's a desire to tell it in the correct way, the way that the muses saw, literally, they witnessed these events at Troy. But, at the same time, this is what I'm kind of fascinated by, while they at the same time are, are you know, um, claiming to hand down the tradition directly from the muses, an outsider can observe that that tradition was quite multiform and that there wasn't only one way to do it. So there's a tension there between what is being claimed by the text and what reality is. Yes, okay, thank you. I, I tell you what it reminds me of, I like to listen to jazz. And if you go to a jazz concert, you, and in the intermission, people are always saying, oh, this isn't real jazz. Real jazz was written in the 1920s, or real jazz didn't start until the 1970s. And I just wonder if there's a sort of human nature that people want to take ownership 
of, of these great cultures and um, and define them as their own and and actually not let other people in to, uh, to mess with them. But thank you very much, I think it's been fascinating. Now, before we started talking, um, there was a question somebody had asked about uh, how we do the Homer multi-text. Uh, Keith, would this be a good uh, time to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so uh, what we've been doing for quite a long time now, really since 2007 when we got the images of the Venetus A manuscript of the Iliad and two others when we were, when we were able to go to Venice and, and photograph them and put them online, um, we have been having teams of undergraduate students and their professors come to the Center for Hellenic Studies in the summer, and they, um, they get sort of trained in our editing procedures, but also we talk about um, what we're doing. We talk about why we're making a Homer multi-text. We talk about, you know, the multiformity of the Iliad. We talk about the fieldwork of Milman Perry and Albert Lord and oral tradition and things like that. And we usually focus on a particular book. So, for example, last summer was book 20, because um, that was the last book we had left to go. So now we've actually edited the entire Benetis A manuscript, and this summer we'll be working on other manuscripts. Um, and we're thinking of, uh, of uh, going back to Iliad 10, um, and instead of doing just solely one manuscript, we already have Iliad 10 edited for the Benetis A, but we'll do the Benetis B and, 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 and maybe a couple of other manuscripts. We already have some papyri some papyrus texts that, of, of Iliad 10 that have been edited, so we can then put it all together and, and make interesting comparisons um, between them. But basically, the way it works is you have, you have teams, small teams of undergraduate students who come and get trained and along with their professors, and then they go home to their home institutions and work all year long, totally as volunteer work, um, but, but the students just love it. And, uh, and, and for example, there's a, a manuscripts, a documents and inscriptions club at, at Holy Cross that has like 40 students in it that go every Friday and work for hours editing, not just the Homer multi-text stuff, but, but other like inscriptions and, 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 other, and other things. Um, so we've been very fortunate to draw on uh, the enthusiasm and interest of, 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 these, of these teams of graduates and their, and their professors. Um, and that's how, after finally, like, I don't know, more than 10 years, we we finally edited the whole Venetis A. <laughs> but in our defense, in addition to the text, there are just voluminous amounts of um, these tiny, tiny comments in the mar margins, some of which are only a millimeter high. It's a lot of material um, to edit. And we were kind of, you know, having to figure out a lot of stuff along the way in terms of how to do this work because it hadn't been done before. I may have a, just a last remark. Thank you, Casey, very much. Um, we are somehow um, we have focused on the side of the performer, the side of the of the the version as we know it, even as a uh, Panathenaic or let's say fixed and this centralized, uh, unified, fixed uh, entity as we have it, as we cherish it. Um, but isn't it uh, the way that the um, the Homeric text is uh, eventually um, expanded, uh, isn't it um, a kind of a throwing the ball to the audience, like a marker that the audience, uh, um, the receptive audience, is as sophisticated as not to expect that in Iliad 20 the whole thing ends without the resolution, without you know the development, and in a way it's it's even kind of complementary to the audience that's receiving, enjoying, and uh, it's like adding value uh, to the audience itself. Just thank you. Absolutely, and I certainly don't mean to imply that the audience is not a crucial component in this dynamic of tradition. Um, obviously, what there is—it's hard to put into words, but there's certainly a a, a feeling that uh, that either the poem, if, if the poem succeeds, it has, it has adhered to tradition in the way that the audience um, feels is correct, right? And if 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 they if they're objecting, then clearly the the um, the, the performer is has not succeeded. Um, a, a great e example of this, I think, is in um, Odyssey eight when Odysseus requests that Demodocus sing the story of the fall of Troy. Now this is a big test because Odysseus himself was there, 
So if the poet sings it incorrectly, Odysseus is going to know, not that Demodocus knows that he's Odysseus or anything, but, and the Phaeacians don't know either, but still, it's a quite a test. And if you remember, Odysseus's reaction is tears, right? He cries. And so clearly, Demodocus has gotten it right. And so too, I think, with a traditional audience, um, that if there are tears, if there's an emotional response, then the performer has succeeded in adhering into to tradition in a way that they expect and desire. But um, I agree with you that there's a sophistication there too, because the audience is not, you know, stupid. They they know that I always tell this to my students, the, the Greeks were aware that there were other versions of the myths out there, right? They knew there was not just one version of Hercules' labors or whatever. They knew that there were varying uh, forms of these myths and they knew that there was varying ways to tell the tale. And so, yeah, the poet is signaling to his audience, you know, possibly that we might know of this other way of telling it, but we're not gonna do that um, here. And, um, but I would say, uh, even though the story is known in advance, and even though like, like sort of like there's a shared understanding of what tradition is, for example, the audience fully expects, I think, Penelope, at least in the, you know, most cases, fully expects Penelope to have stayed faithful and to reunite with Odysseus. There's nevertheless a kind of tension that builds throughout the, the, um, the epic that maybe she won't, right? And it's like, well, how can this be? They already know the story. And yet somehow that tension still exists. And I think, I think it's sort of, the best analogy I can think for it is like when you watch, not everybody has this, but a lot of people have like one movie that they watch over and over and over again. And they get really excited when they get to certain parts, even though they know that what's gonna happen, they still get on the edge of their seat when you know some big confrontation is happening or someone's about to die or something, whatever. Um, and I think there's some, some, something like that where um, this tradition is that you know what's gonna happen and yet there's always like this, this tension that maybe it won't. Part, partially because it's a, unlike a movie, it is a live performance. So there is, even if it's a, a remote possibility, an unlikely possibility, there is still always the possibility that the poet is going to go off the rails and not do it right. <laughs> you know? And so, the, yeah, there's this tension there um, that, that I think the audience is, is feeling, um, even as the, the poet may be signaling these other possibilities. All right, our hour is about up. Um, but as the moderator, I'm going to take the last question. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay, so the, the manuscripts that you are studying are medieval, I think you said, um, that are recording these various um, other other readings, these multiforms. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, how much of a gap um, is there, do you know, between the latest multiforms that would have been live, say, so to speak, um, and their, their recording in medieval times? Are these recording multiforms that existed a thousand years before, but then stopped being performed? Well, so one of the things that's really interesting is that even though they're recorded in medieval documents, um, they seem to be being excerpted from scholarship that goes back to the second and first centuries and third centuries even BC. Um, so uh, the commentaries of Aristarchus, for example. So there are places in the medieval um, traditions we're not, it's not, it hasn't been fully reconstructed, at least in a way that's accepted by everybody. The sources for all the, the material that's in the, the Venetus A. But the Venetus A manuscript, for example, at the end of each book has a little subscription. And it says this, you know, this material comes from, and it lists four works that vary from, you know, the Hellenistic to the Roman times. So clearly it's drawing on sources that are at least a thousand years before when this manuscript was being written. Um, so there's that, but then um, the comments themselves talk about, for example, the work of Aristarchus, which you know is even before when those those comments are being written down. So it, it really 
takes us back more than a thousand years, 1200 years before the, the writing of the Venetese manuscript, that material. We also, it's not, it's not as prolific, but we do have some papyrus texts from um, quite early that have uh, some commentary on them, not nearly as much, but, uh, but so some of this material that's being recorded uh, is, is, is really early. And some of our early, earliest papyri, so this is a topic that has really interested me and I have a chapter on it in, in my forthcoming book. Um, so some of our, when, when you go back and look at the papyrus texts that have survived for the, for the Iliad, um, they, uh, they're all fragmentary, of course, so we don't have like any kind of like whole book or anything like that. But if you go back and look at them, the older they are, the, mul the more multiform the text is that they have. So what that shows us is that in like, for example, the second century BCE, the Iliad was being written down in a multiform way. Um, now, what is the source of that multiformity? Are they performances? We don't really know exactly what are the circumstances in which these papyri are coming into being. But I would presume that at least some of them are just the taking down of performances, like kind of like what Perry and Moore did in a way, but we have to not be anachronistic about it. They're, they're somehow being, you know, written down on the basis of performances. And those performances were, were multiform, as we would expect of a performance tradition. That is quite late in the performance tradition, right? We're, we're really, we really past the point when we should expect there to be a lot of variety um, in the text. And yet, and yet, there is a lot of variety if you look at the earliest, earliest text. So if you look at a fragment of a papyrus from like say second century BC, you are very likely to find plus verses, those verses like I showed at the beginning of the presentation. You are very likely to find additional verses, sometimes fewer verses in places, but also whole lines that are different. Um, you just find a lot of what we call multiformity. Nothing so like earth shattering that like, like I say, like Odysseus, you know, doesn't make it home kind of thing, but, but still a different text. And what I would say that makes sense. In an oral tradition, it makes sense that our earliest witnesses to the text would be the most multiple form, and that later we go through various kinds of bottlenecks to reach a single version like we have. I mean, and we don't just have a single version. I should emphasize that. In the medieval manuscripts, we have about 25 manuscript families. So you can't reduce it all to like, for example, a Vulgate or something like that. Um, so, but yeah, we would expect the, the more uniform text to arise at the end and that the further back you go, it should be more multiform. And that is exactly what we find in our sources. Thank you. All right, well, we should, uh, we should wrap it up since uh, people okay. are leaving and- uh, Thank you all for your interest and your questions. Thanks so much, Casey. All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.